We continue the second stage of our three-part small block Chevy build, and today we take it to the dyno, plus the basics on torque values and the tools. Thanks for joining us back here on Engine Power. Today, we're gonna finish assemble and dyno stage two of our three-stage small block Chevy buildup. If you remember, we started stage one with a basic Chevy 350 block we filled with stock replacement parts in the bottom end. But we stepped up to a better flowing aluminum cylinder head from Summit, a YN single plane intake, and a Holley 650 car. The payoff was 357 horsepower and 389 pound-feet of torque. Great results for a budget of less than four grand. For stage two though, we put the parts back on the shelf and threw out that budget. You see our goal this time is to make the most naturally aspirated power we can get out of that little mouse block. So after tweaking the block to improve oil flow, we started with a 3750 Eagle stroker crank to pump up the cubic inches to 383. For a cam, a more aggressive solid roller from Comp. And along the way, we carefully checked all the critical clearances to ensure getting the most out of our much stouter bottom end. Eagle sent us a competition rotating assembly with molly forged pistons and rings to hang on our H-beam rods. So now we can continue on by dropping in our fully soaked comp solid lifters. They have a 300 thousandths taller body to clear the taller lifter bosses of our late model block. Sealing up our stroker's increased cylinder pressure are Cometic 27 thousandths thick MLS head gaskets. These AFR 220 eliminator heads are their largest, best flowing 23 degree heads that use conventional rocker arms. The heavy duty intake valves measure 2100 and the Inconel exhaust valves are at 1600. These heads have a stiffer pack racing spring capable of 800 lift and 8000 RPM. We're reusing our ARP head bolts and torquing them to 70 pound-feet. Before we finish the valve train, we got a little pre-assembly work to do on this AFR Titan TXR intake. Because of its unique design and the plastic composite material it's made with, AFR insists that you follow their directions to the letter to prevent leaks. We start by press fitting these compression limiters in the valley plate. We also need to drill a hole in the manifold spider and install this provided vacuum fitting. Back on the valley plate, we need to install all the coolant port seals. Then we can pre-assemble the spider to the valley plate with the logo facing toward the front of the engine. We'll just hand start the socket head cap screws. You have to use the supplied Dow Corning 732 on the block's china rail. A gasket or silicone could result in losing oil. We can now place the valley plate and spider on the engine and temporarily bolt it down and torque to 25 pound-feet. Now the spider gets removed so we can install the remaining seals in the valley plate and in the spider. We need to put some of our sealant in these bolt holes to prevent oil seepage in addition to the places where the gaskets and valley plate seal come together. Finally, we can mount the spider to the valley plate and tighten everything down for good. Well, that's the way we install it. And now we got the advantage of an interchangeable spider. Well, we got the baddest race version available. We could swap this thing out for a more streetable single or dual plane and use the same valley plate with no changes. Or we could take it off and port and polish it if we wanted to. Right now, what we want to do is let that sealant dry for about 24 hours while we move on to some more work. Like finishing up installing the rest of our valve train, we'll start by installing our shaft system's billet rocker stand with the supplied hardware. And we'll torque them to 55 pound-feet. After that, we can drop in our custom length comp push rods. These are 3 8 in diameter with 135 thousandths wall thickness for extra stiffness and less deflection. The rockers go on one set at a time per cylinder in the engine's firing order. We'll cold lash them to 10 thousandths on the intake, 14 thousandths on the exhaust. Now I'm gonna go ahead and get the rest of these bolted down and set up, but there's still a lot more to come, so stay with us. So man, you happy you jumped in on this one or what? I'm happier than a woodpecker in a lumber yard. <laughs> <laughs> and you know you're getting closer when the valve covers go on. 
These are extra tall to clear those rockers. And we're going to reuse our Summit ProFlow electric water pump we had on stage one in the dyno. Now remember, an electric water pump has no parasitic loss of power like a belt driven one does. You might remember in stage one of this project, a 650 CFM carburetor was used, which was all well and good. This time, though, in the search for more power, we're stepping up to this quick fuel Black Diamond 950 CFM carburetor. Now, this brings us to a common question we get a lot of times. How do you know how much carb to use with your application? Well, listen up, class. Professor Pat's going to tell you. We'll use a formula that's a theoretical guideline so you don't get a carburetor that's too small for your application. And keep in mind, this formula does not take into account the pressure drop that the CFM was rated at, but it'll keep you out of the woods. The formula is engine's cubic inch displacement times its maximum RPM divided by 3456, and that equals the carburetor's CFM at 100% volumetric efficiency. And what I mean by volumetric efficiency, it's the engine's intake tract ability to fill the cylinder from top dead center to bottom dead center on its intake stroke. And most engines operate between 75% and 95% volumetric efficiency. And 100% and above are just reserved for true horsepower per cubic inch engines, like a NASCAR style or an NHRA Pro Stock. The long version of this equation computes how many intake strokes there are per a four cycle engine and converts cubic inches to cubic feet. But if we use our 3456 as a factor, it will work on any carburetor. So how did we apply this formula to our combination? Well, we took our 383 cubic inches and we multiplied it by 8,000 RPM, which is what we plan to turn it, and divided it by 3456. And that gave us a grand total of 800 86.57 CFM. And that's how you can accurately compute your theoretical minimum carburetor CFM. Or simply use Summit's calculator on their website, get your carburetor and just put the thing on. Well, it didn't take long to get to this part. No, no, this is my favorite part actually. Let me get, let me get her up. Again, we're shooting for horsepower numbers well over 500 with this stage two small block. I guess they were thinking ahead last time using these inch and three quarter headers from Doug's because we're using them again. It's hard to get headers that are too big. For Spark, we're upgrading from the HEI distributor used in stage one to this MSD Pro billet. No cutting corners on spark plugs either. Our wires will snake down to these new E3 diamond fires. Now we'll dump in seven quarts of Royal Purple XPR 5W30. For fuel, we'll feed our mouse with 93 octane pump gas. After a few more final hookups, we're gonna light it off. All right, Joe, you ready? Yeah. We'll set the initial timing at 28 degrees and run the engine to get to operating temp. Then shut it down and hot lash the valves. 16 thousandths on the intake, 20 thousandths on the exhaust. I'm impressed, it sounds great. I agree. Now during the break, we're gonna let it warm up again, get some oil temp into it where we want it, and then you can get ready for some stage two horsepower. We're back and ready for the initial pull. I guess the standard operating procedure for this first pull, right? Yep, we're gonna make a short blast, uh, 2,500 to 5,000, just to see what the pressures and the fluids look like, and uh, we'll go from there and see what happens. Okay. Remember, you time for torque and jet for horsepower. Still got all our guts. Yeah. The graph is solid, so let the tuning begin. At 28 degrees of timing, all the sweeps will be between 3,500 and 6,500 RPM. Sounded good again. I liked it. I liked it. Oh, how about oh, that right there? Not bad. 488. 488 horsepower, 440 pound feet of torque. What do you think? More timing. More timing. Uh, let's put like three degrees in it and okay. uh, see what happens. The goal is to find maximum timing without detonation or power loss. I think it liked it. It definitely liked it. Holy moly. <laughs> 536 horsepower, 472 pound feet of torque. We repeated this process one degree at a time, checking the plugs along the way. 
Still, see it crept up a little bit. 543 horsepower, 476 pound-feet. Little tiny gains. That's where we're going one at a time because um, we can overtime it at some point. So we're just creeping up on it, and we're going to still sneak it in until that levels off. So, well, one more degree. Another degree. All we right. got to do it. We're up to 37 degrees. All right. I think we found it. You think so? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There it is. 541, 473. Beautiful. We've reached our limit too. But after some shut-eye, we're picking it back up. But overnight, we had a huge weather swing. The air went from cool and dry to warmer, humid, and rainy. So since we don't have controlled dyno air, the power will be affected slightly. With timing back to our sweet spot at 36 degrees, we're making a new baseline run. Well, let's see where we are today. 535 for power. 473 for torque compared to yesterday when we had the same torque but 541 horsepower. So we're down about a percent. Not too shabby though, so let's move on. The first thing we're going to do before we make any changes to the carburetor is stack two AFR one inch spacers in designed to run on this manifold. The one against the manifold has an open center and the one under the carb is a tapered fur hole. This will maximize the plenum area and change the way the air fuel charge comes into the manifold. Two carburetor spacers totaling two inches, everything else being the same. What do you, what you think? It's going to be interesting. That it will. Here we go. Ooh, we might have seen a couple extra on that one. Considering 547, <laughs> 485 for torque, that's a gain of 12 horsepower and 12 pound feet of torque. Peak horsepower was at 6,400 RPM and peak torque was at 5,300. I don't know if a jet would do anything to it. It might make it a little worse. So what we can do safely for now is change an air bleed. We're going from 32 thousandths to 36 thousandths for a 4 thousandths increase. Same RPM. Let's let it rip. How do you think? Well, maybe it likes the air. Turns out no. <laughs> Turns out no, it doesn't like it at all. Oh. 537 horse, 474 pound-feet for a loss of 10 horsepower and 11 pound-feet. Peak horsepower was at 6,500 RPM and peak torque occurred at 5,200 RPM. So we're cheating the difference down to 34 thousandths. All right, little change. A little less air. We're gonna see what it does here. Wow, see what happened there. The curve looks nice. 545 horse, 480 pound feet. I like that. Peak horsepower was at 6,400, and peak torque was at 5,400. And that's okay, because you know what that means is those spacers put our carb right in the range where it needed to be as far as uh, air fuel mix. And uh, nothing wrong with that. That's why we that's why we dyno. You couldn't feel that in the car. You no. could see it in a time slip, but uh, Hey, that's what dynoing's all about. You always don't make a gain. It's uh, sometimes good to know what doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Time to back up a little and replace the original 36 thousandths air bleeds. And we're not done yet. We still have one more change that may or may not help us out. Well, Pat, I've had a blast helping you out on this thing. Man, Joe, glad you're here. Well, we got the original bleeds reinstalled because, well, as it turned out, they were correct for this setup. But, you know, it's worth the effort to find out. Absolutely, because when you make a change, it doesn't always result in a gain, but hey, that's why it's called tuning. Well, we got one more thing to try out. Now, we've been running this thing through two and a half inch exhaust pipes. What would another half inch difference make? We're gonna find out. They're being fed by inch and three quarter headers. That stays the same. But if the smaller exhaust pipes were a restriction, our three inch replacements should make a difference in power. Yeah, you guessed it, another experiment. This is the, uh, the grand finale. Drum roll. <laughs> I don't believe what I just saw. Look what the torque did, 495. We got 10 more. 
that was totally unexpected, but I guess just like with those air bleed changes, you never know what's gonna happen. And I was glad you were here to see it. Me too. This engine is a great example of what a popular combo on pump gas is capable of. And even though it's not a full tilt race bullet, we show that it is still very sensitive to tuning changes, but we're not done. We still have stage three planned, and that will involve taking most of the components and putting them in an aftermarket block with a centrifugal pressurizer and a trick blow through throttle body injection system. Watch for it in the future. Do you want to build an LS that makes big power? Well, this is a great place to start. This is a new GM factory overstock 4.8 and 5.3 liter LS block from Summit Racing. It's made out of cast iron to withstand high horsepower applications better than aluminum, and it also has stock 9240 deck height. The bores are finished at 3780, and it also has six bolt main caps with the cam bearings already installed. It's a stout start to your LS build, and it's very affordable for only around 400 bucks. All engines make heat, and DEI makes some products that protect your engine components from the damages of heat. Components like spark plug wires and boots. This is an eight-pack set of their protective boots designed to protect against header and exhaust manifold heat and lower the risk of backfiring and engine damage. They're guaranteed to handle up to 1,200 degrees. They fit most straight and 90-degree boots, and they come in a variety of seven different colors. An eight-cylinder set will set you back less than 60 bucks. Did you know that rockauto.com now offers complete exhaust kits for any vehicle you drive? That's right, all the pieces and parts to get the job done without any of the guesswork. And instead of digging through the store shelves, you just navigate their user-friendly website to get the system or individual components you need. And you can even track your order here. So whether it's mufflers or mud flaps, if it goes on a vehicle, you can find it all at rockauto.com. One question we hear a lot from novice engine builders is how important is the correct torquing of engine fasteners? Well, let's talk about cylinder head studs and bolts. They have to withstand enormous loads to keep the head sealed to the gasket and the block. Here's an example of what those loads are. A regular gasoline engine with a four inch bore will see between 1100 and 1200 pounds per square inch at peak combustion pressure for around 14,000 pounds of pressure per cylinder pressing up on the cylinder head. That means each fastener could see as much as five tons of pressure each at wide open throttle. To keep the head gasket sealed under those conditions requires a clamp load of about three times the peak pressure created against the bottom of the cylinder head. Now that's called the liftoff force and it varies depending on the application. The fasteners around the combustion chamber have to share a combined force of about 45,000 pounds to keep the cylinder head in place. Now the more bolts or studs you have around the combustion chamber, the better that load is spread out. Cylinder heads, main caps, and connecting rods have the most critical fasteners in the entire engine. They must be in perfect condition and lubricated properly to achieve accurate torque values. These fasteners are designed to stretch when tightened and the force of the wrench does two things. First, it's overcoming the friction between the threads of the fastener and the threads in the block. Also, the friction under the head of the bolt as it turns against the cylinder head, which accounts for 85 to 90% of the force from the wrench. Second, Tightening the fastener creates clamp load as it stretches. This accounts for the remaining 10 to 15% of the force from the wrench. There are a few types of torque wrenches we use for these fasteners. The first is a beam type, and these are accurate to within plus or minus 2% of the torque value. Next in line is a click type, which is accurate to within plus or minus 5%. And finally, there's an electric, which is pricey, but has a lot of technology built in. Accuracy comes from several factors like the lube that's used, the cleanliness of the threads, and a torque wrench that's calibrated correctly. To check the accuracy of the torque wrenches, we use a digital torque wrench tester from Intercom. Now its accuracy is within plus or minus 0.25% and has modes for inch pounds, pound feet, and newton meters. To demonstrate, I'll apply 60 inch pounds on the beam style and hold it steady. It's spot on. This lets us know that Matco did an excellent job calibrating this torque wrench. So now you know the importance, torque on. Well, that's it for this week. Until next time, though, peace.